I saw a, a, a letter that was offered from a farmer in Illinois back in the 1960s. He had just bought a new 45 combine and a two-row head. And he said that in seven and a half hours, he was able to harvest almost 1,500 bushels of corn. And today we're doing that with modern machines in about 15 minutes. I'd like to throw a shade to, to uh, Sarah Wyatt and, and the team. How many of you could look back in your life and say that there are persons or persons that you are friends with that have made a difference in your life, that have made you a better person? Great. I hope the networking opportunity here helps to build the relationship of the agriculture family here in Washington. And I was so honored to see Senator Pat Roberts. He and I went in the hallway and had a glass of ethanol just a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> but when you think about the, the, the work that's done with AgriPulse, whether it's Spencer's Newsmakers or Open Mic or some of the others, you have the opportunity to meet the decision makers. You have an opportunity to understand their personality and their perspective, and I think that makes us all better. But somebody had to have the vision, and that was Sarah 20 years ago. So let's give her a warm, deserved round of applause. All right, so our topic today is discussing opportunities from the export space. Now, we can't possibly have all of the commodity groups that are uh, here and at one time, uh, but we certainly do have those here that are representative. I would also share this is my first time to be on the national stage and only using a digital device, and it's already let me down. So we're <laughs> bear with me. Here we go. Our first introduction today is Dana Brooks. She's beside me here, and she is uh, the CEO of the Pet Food Institute. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. So just a, um, a little bit about Pet Food Institute. I, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you have at least one dog or cat at home? Raise your hands. Okay. How many have more than one dog or cat at home? Raise your hands. Okay. You made my statistic to start right here. Uh, two in three households today have a pet, have at least one. So that is approximately 180 million bowls to feed in the United States alone. I know that a lot of you are from rural communities, and I can say this in all truth. We, my mother can't even count the number of pets she has, so she made up for a lot of you that didn't raise your hands. So thank you, though. Um, we, Pet Food Institute represents a vast majority of the pet food manufactured in the United States. Um, so we have, we have all the big companies that manufacture. We have small, we have medium size, we have kibble and bits, and we have uh, that refrigerated section in, in the grocery stores. So we have a, a really great opportunity in growth. Uh, we're a growth industry, and I know it's kind of, this is maybe like having pet food on the panel, like the joke I said, what is, what is wine? potato and meat have in common. <laughs> International trade as well as uh, we, our consumers are probably all the same people. So uh, we have, we're, we're not eating people back there, but, uh, <laughs> but um, um, anyway, we, we're really excited to be able to talk about our story and how we see the export market for us and the opportunity in that. And we, um, we are, our U.S. pet food manufacturers are the largest in the world, and a lot of them are global as well. And with that, you know, some of them are also human food manufacturers. And that has changed pet food a lot over the decades. Also, we are more com consumer packaged good. We're not the same as, um, we're in the grocery store. And we're products that you're putting in your cart with your wine, with your potatoes, and with your meat, with your children in the basket as well. So you're taking it home. So we are very different than where we were even when, you know, when I was growing up and the change with that and the fact that we have uh, pets are in our beds. They're everyday part of our lives. And we see this growth not only in domestic. Obviously, we, you know, we have, we're one of the largest um, pet food consumers, you know, uh, purchasers in the United States. But then also the growth internationally because having a pet has become a status symbol. 
So a lot of countries that may even be restrictive financially are, 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 are getting pets. Some countries, they're actually seeing a reduction in uh, families, in marriages, and having children because of the limiting factor of income, but they'll get a pet. So really, it's become um, a changing environment nationally and internationally. And we'll talk a bit more about the opportunities that we have in the Q&A. So. I'm really not sure that Lou the Labrador at home is a status symbol for me, but maybe we have a lot in common. <laughs> let's talk potatoes, and let's do that with the CEO of the National Potato Council. Please welcome Cam Quarles. Jeff. Jeff, thank you, and thanks to Sarah as well and everybody at the AgriPulse team. Um, how many p people have at least one potato at home? <laughs> are, are we all going to do that? Um, so, uh, we're at, so National Potato Council, we are um, the association, the lobbying arm for the industry. We represent all of the growers in the United States of Irish potatoes. So we're not, every, uh, the second question I usually get is, what about sweet potatoes? Totally different commodity. We're we're just the the Irish potatoes that you would you would see in a variety of different forms. Um, some people might uh, remember that I grew up in the citrus industry in California, and so how we made our money in the citrus was largely you're selling fresh product, uh, both domestically and internationally. Potatoes, a vastly different um, uh, type of industry. Uh, uh, we have very diverse channels of trade um, processed. Uh, that is by far the biggest category that's being exported around the world, frozen potato products. Uh, you have fresh, you have dehydrated potato products. You've got chips. You have fresh potatoes that are being shipped exclusively to make chips in a foreign market. So each one of those has um, an interesting variation, it has interesting details that are either uh, empowering or limiting depending on the market that, you, that you're going into. What, um, what's fascinating to me, so we, we asked, and this actually just came out about three weeks ago, we asked Michigan State to do a study of just the export uh, section of our business, which is about 20% of all of the farm gate value of potatoes has to be exported in one of those forms that I just mentioned. Um, and so Michigan State looked at that and said, okay, all right, what does that mean? Um, roughly 34,000 jobs in the United States are directly supported by those potato exports, uh, as well as um, uh, you have about $4.78 billion, this is both direct and indirect economic activity generated for the U.S. over those annual operations of just our exports. So it's a, it's a huge deal for us. Um, we spend an, a tremendous amount of time on, on export issues. Um, and just a, just a couple of, of data points for you, um, how important it has been just over the last 25 years. Uh, when you look at who the top markets were for us, this is back in 1999. It was Japan, it was Canada, and Mexico. Today, it's Mexico, Japan, and Canada. It hasn't changed, the, the order has changed, but it's still those top three countries. But the, the magnitude of the increases is really striking. Um, for Japan, our, our exports have increased about 80% to Japan. Pretty impressive. Canada, 151%. The amazing one is Mexico, up almost 700% uh, just since 1999. And a lot of that is things we're going to talk about here, addressing um, tariffs, sanitary and phytosanitary barriers, uh, and certainly a lot of these technical barriers which hamper us. In my house, we were full of taters. I was the broadcaster and I was the commentator. The boys were commentators too. <laughs> the daughter was the sweet tater and the ex-wife was the dictator. <laughs> <laughs> so now we can talk about the wine industry and please welcome Charles Jefferson, the Vice President of the Federal and International Public Policy for the Wine Institute. I'm gonna go ahead and raise my hand. I have a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I'm not going to try and respond to that. Uh, but, uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, AgriPulse. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, just briefly, for those of you who may not be as familiar with Wine Institute, uh, we are a trade association as well. We represent about 1,000 wine producers across the state of California. And our membership is responsible for about 80% of all U.S. wine production and about 95% of, of U.S. wine exports. Um, historically, our producers have been able to rely on a, a vibrant, strong, growing uh, U.S. wine market. Um, and so we only exported, uh, historically, about a little less than 10% of, of U.S. wine production, and that tended to go to a few established markets, Canada, United Kingdom, uh, the EU. What we've seen in the last three to five years is that um, Demand in those markets has been relatively flat to declining in, in some of those places. And that's really forced our producers to look at, at new developing markets, uh, places like India, Vietnam, Mexico, uh, Africa, um, in a way that they, they've never had to do so in the past. And um, that's both daunting and exciting. Um, I think it is, it is, those markets present a, a great opportunity uh, growing incredibly fast, growing middle classes. Uh, wine is an aspirational product. And so we see great opportunity there, um, despite some of the challenges. Um, but just to give you a, a couple of numbers, uh, our, our wine exports peaked in 2016 at about $1.6 billion in value. Um, and they've faced uh, a number of different headwinds uh, since then, uh, certainly uh, the pandemic uh, comes to mind as well as currency and other issues. But in 2020, they hopefully bottomed out at a little over 1.2 billion, and we've been uh, struggling to claw back to where we were uh, since then. Um, you know, as an alcoholic beverage, wine is a, a highly regulated product in every market it goes into, and it always has been, and, and we understand that or are used to to operating in that environment. But it, it does mean that um, we have to deal with uh, everything from both market access issues to sometimes significant uh, non-tariff barriers, TBT issues as well. And we have a, a long history of, of doing that. Um, Wine Institute's also been an active uh, cooperator in the, the MAP program at FAS for, for decades. And that's that's been extremely critical in, in developing many of these markets. Um, but we think that's really only, only one part of the equation of uh, the current environment we're in. Um, in many of these new target markets that we're focused on, the developing markets, uh, they don't have a history of domestic wine production. And so that, that often creates environments where we have, whether it's intended or unintended, significant TBT non-tariff barriers. At the same time, we're dealing with significant uh, market access and, and tariff barriers as well. Um, so our message uh, to policymakers in the last year or two has really been that we, we have incredible opportunity in some of these places around the world, but we really need a, a policy that focuses on all three of those aspects, um, both market access, uh, the technical barriers, as well as the, the promotion resources. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it is important, and we have had successes on some of those TBT issues, as well as some of the export promotion resources. But if, if our producers uh, are facing a 50% tariff, for example, like they are in Vietnam, and our top competitors are within two to three years of being at zero, it's very hard for us to make the case to our members to invest in those markets. Um, so we're, we're trying to balance um, the opportunity and, and convince uh, our policymakers that it is very real um, so we can address some of these challenges. But that's, that's just a brief snapshot of the, the wine market. You actually have a picture here uh, on stage of what would be a great family at home. We're having prime rib, a baked potato, and a glass of wine. And the dog is under the table begging for a bite. <laughs> Dan Hallstrom. But cannot have human food. It's going to get pet food. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Dan Hallstrom is president and CEO of the U.S. Meat Export Federation. Dan, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, congratulations to Sarah and the AgriPulse team as well. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, my table, uh, quite often, we have potatoes. We have a lot of wine. 
and of course beef at the center of the plate. Um, and our dogs are under the table wanting a little bit of all of that. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be with this group. So U.S. Meat Export Federation, uh, a little bit about us. We're based in Denver, Colorado, Trade Association, focused on the international sphere. Um, we're representing the beef, pork, and lamb industries in the U.S. Um, we're really a diversified portfolio of membership, not only beef, pork, and lamb producers, but exporters, also the corn, soybean uh, industries as well. So really a diversified portfolio. Um, a little bit about uh, our, our results globally. Uh, the international space is the fastest growing space and it has been for quite a few years now for the beef and pork industries. Uh, we exported last year uh, just about a little over 18 billion in sales uh, between beef, pork, and lamb. A year before that was a record at a little over 19 billion. Uh, that represents about 30% of our pork production is exported and about 15% of our beef production. And it's really all about adding the value, which we're going to talk about uh, today. But one thing I would like, and I'd like to reiterate a few other comments that have already been made, but one of the keys to the success in this area has been the collaboration with FAS and the government cooperator program, MAP, FMD, and soon to be RAP. So uh, we're very uh, appreciative of that, to say the least. Uh, a little bit of, uh, just real quick snapshot. We're seeing the same sort of growth and diversification of markets as I'm sure some of the other uh, uh, organizations are up here. Uh, we, we started out for many years with you know, Japan, Korea, Mexico as being the, the uh, base, and they still are the base, but now we're talking about countries such as uh, Colombia, we're talking about Indonesia, we're talking about Philippines. And of course, uh, my favorite topic now is the African region, which is one of the fastest growing regions for beef. So uh, excited to get into it in a little more detail this afternoon with all of you. Thank you. All right, let's, let's take this uh, from the, the beginning. Let's look at, and I'll use the Department of Agriculture's recent forecast, that we're going to sell about $170 billion worth of ag products, but we're going to import $200 billion. So for 2024, if the world was perfect, now we have to leave out monetary policy, but if you had a fair and level playing field, if nothing was in your way and you could capture the universe of the market for 2024, what would it be? Where do you think you'll be? What could it be if these other things were out of the way? Can I start on that one? Um, we actually, ha as part of that study I mentioned, we asked that very thing. We said, all right, look, uh, we've got substantial market access um, activities that are going on uh, in, say, Japan. We'd love to have access to Japan for fresh market potatoes. Uh, if we can also build out Mexico, which was a, a multi-decade battle to, to secure fresh market access there, and then also see reasonable growth in some of our other core markets, what would that mean for our overall exports? It's about another 20% on top of what we're already generating and another 5,000 jobs. So a, a very significant opportunities for us. In fre just simply in fresh potatoes alone, you would be pushing a 40 to 45 percent increase just getting those two markets open. That, that's how, how significant Mexico and Japan would be for us. So what would that statistic mean in dollars and cents? Just ballpark it, just among um, us friends here. Ballpark, uh, Mexico fully built out 100 million a year. So our, our most recent numbers for fresh exports, we're moving about $310 million a year. Mexico would add 100 million to that fully built out. Japan's almost a mirror image of that. So five, 500 million in fresh every Dan? year. Yeah, on the uh, protein side, um, substantial. Uh, we have su substantial potential today with a lot of headwinds. If, we, if the world were perfect, uh, you're, you're talking about 19 billion in sales last year. You could easily be in a 25 plus billion. And that's just from increased access. Vietnam's a good example on the beef side. We have ridiculously high tariffs. Uh, almost no business goes in there unless it's cheap. If you're on a level playing field, you'd, you'd really be the player, especially on high quality value added uh, product like, like beef or pork. 
Uh, Indonesia is another area that has issues on access. Uh, as some parts of Africa, Nigeria is another example. So yeah, uh, we feel like there's a lot of opportunity today, but in your environment, Jeff, it'd be phenomenal. Number? 25 plus billion from where we're at today easily. Charles? Um, it's a great question. It's, it's challenging for wine. We're uh, talking about much smaller numbers in general. I would love to have some of these numbers to talk about for wine, but um, I think, you know, in the early 2000s and up, uh, leading up to around 2013, 2014, we were seeing 10% plus annual growth. And I think we could easily get back to that um, and exceed that for wine in some of these markets. So that's you know, uh, several hundred million dollars a year in growth, which would be um, extremely significant and when you talk about the numbers um, we're producing here in the U.S. I mean, many of these markets that we're focused on are starting from very low bases. Um, but, I mean, the story of wine in our, our, our export markets is, is one that we, we look at in decades, you know, not, not move really it, year Move it all year. out of the way. What could you do? What's your universe? Uh, I mean, we have set a goal of, I think, to grow to, I believe it's 2.5 billion by 2030. So Great. that would be that'd be a almost 100 percent growth. Okay, um, Dana, the, the dogs period. at the house on the farm stayed outside. They did their job. They worked. They did other things. The dog that's in home stays inside, goes outside to play, stays inside, has his own food, has his own bed, sleeps with his owner doesn't know he's a dog. They go to doggy daycare, they get their nails done, they play with other dogs, <laughs> they go on vacation. Are all these people around the world spending as much on their pets as we are, and what does that mean for you in the pet food industry as a universe? Oh, that's all true, what you're saying about the mm -hmm. United States. Some countries haven't quite caught up to that um, socialization or human-animal bond that we have, but there is growth in that. And that's where we, we do see that in our export markets as well. And going back to like your ideal world, yeah. there is no question that we could double uh, pretty easily. Which would be? What, I mean, right now, so domestically we're six, 60 billion in sales. We've, dub we've doubled in pet food sales just since I've been at PFI for six years. That was a good hire for them. I, I, I'm going to take full credit. <laughs> um, we've also seen double-digit growth in exports until 2023. 20, uh, but um, with that was inflation and other challenge, global challenges. But Brazil is a big country for us to, enter, you know, we want to see entrance into that. And um, because of government, taxes, things like that, that's holding us out. And we see that as a society. Talk about loving their pets, too. Mm. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars if we could have a level playing field. So now this is open question for who wants to talk. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had Doug McCaleb, the chief ag negotiator for the U.S. Trade Representative's office on, and he described the Biden administration's plan on trade to go after tariffs instead of trade agreements. And his reasoning was that you may take years to develop a FDA, and then years after that before you would really see a result, whereas if they go after tariffs now, there would be a more immediate result. Offer critique of what you hear and what you would hope for. Has there been a benefit? Could there be a greater benefit of just going after the tariffs? Or does there need to be trade deals? I, I, I can answer that first. Um, first, if we wouldn't have had China phase one, we wouldn't be, that wouldn't be. And I want to thank some of our folks here today that were very much a part of that. Our top three markets before, just like many, it was uh, Canada, Japan, and Mexico. Top three today, Canada, China, Mexico. So uh, that really opened up, that trade agreement opened up some access for us. Now, obviously, these restrictions that we're facing now, those are also important. So sometimes, I mean, it's like, it's a chicken and the egg, no offense, poultry, but like which goes first, you know? Um, and how, what gives us, the, the China access was huge for our industry. But then if once we, if we get the trade agreement done and then we have barriers of entry, which we do, 
then it, you know, it, it's hard. So I think that both are very important and how they can run simultaneously would be fantastic, but knowing we have limited resources also with the government. Charles, what about the tariff situation, especially as it faces Europe and geographic indicators and other elements that would keep your product out of obviously uh, an area that appreciates their wine? Um, I, I think uh, I would echo a lot of the, the comments we just heard. It's, it's, it's the entire picture that they, we really encourage them to focus on. Um, we've seen uh, what tariff-only deals can do. I mean, the, the Japan agreement from a few years ago was a largely tariff-only deal, and um, our tariff uh, will be at zero, I believe, next year, and we've seen significant growth in that market. So we've, we've been trying to make the case for those. But as I mentioned, as a, as a highly regulated product where we see a lot of non-tariff issues, we need those comprehensive uh, trade agreements. Um, we need um, wine and spirits annexes like there exist in USMCA and other trade agreements because they, they make they help significantly on those fronts. Um, with respect to geographical indicators, um, we certainly uh, still have uh, differing views within our industry and particularly between ourselves and our, our EU colleagues. Um, I think we're all on the same page at a high level. Uh, it's, it's important to protect legitimate GIs. Um, I think we would argue there are some instances though where trading partners have veered uh, outside of that definition of a legitimate GI, and that's still very much a concern. Uh, I think the unfortunate reality in this environment is we're facing uh, bigger challenges than those right now, and so we're really more focused on the, those uh, nuts and bolts tariff and market access issues um, to the extent we can. Um, and so um, that that's what we're urging. Dan, are there people in the world that want U.S. product, but can't get it because of tariffs. They can't get it because of a trade relationship. Yeah, uh, most definitely. And uh, the um, I want to give an example, going back to Dana's example. But you look at these uh, trade agreements. Um, Colombia on beef and pork is probably our fastest growing market in the last ten years. We've gone from twenty million to four hundred million, and a lot of that had to do with the with the uh, trade agreement. Um, but yes, um, th there's, there's a lot of examples in Africa where we just simply don't have access today that if we had uh, unfettered access, uh, th they definitely want our products. So a lot of times what happens is it finds its way in, which creates more cost. You know, if we can legitimize it um, in, in with, with uh, you know, very clear definition of access, uh, this will work to our advantage in a big way. So there's all sorts of opportunity, that being one. Would tariffs only, will the policy of tariffs only at this measure achieve the goal, or do you need both? I think you just answered it. I think, we, I think we need both, yeah. The, the policy work that's being done today on tariffs, and I, I wish they'd focus on Vietnam, that would help the two of us out. But, uh, but um, yeah, it, you need both, because there's a lot of opportunity out there. Charles? Uh, I mean, I think... Uh, we've seen the administration focus on some specific tariff issues in uh, India, for example, and I think they, they did have some success on some of the retaliatory issues that were impacting uh, colleagues. Um, we don't have a retaliatory issue, though. We just have a base tariff of 150%. Um, and so when our Australian colleagues complete a, a trade agreement that has cut them to 75 and will phase them to 25% in, in the coming years, it's... It's just, it's a non-starter, um, irrespective of, of the rest of the picture. Kim, how are you blocked out of markets? And, and would you care to delve into deja vu all over again uh, in the relationship of Mexico and, and then of Japan? Yeah, I, well, so those, those two countries, I think that's an example where you're really having the SPS issues are the ones that are used as the, the measure to, to, to either constrain us or just outright keep us out. Um, so you know, th those, those countries are a specific, they, they have a specific challenge with SPS, but when you look broadly across, uh, and a lot of our exports are focused primarily on the Pacific Rim, uh, you have to do both. Uh, Vietnam has been brought up. Thailand, the Philippines, all of those are constrained by 
uh, 40, 50 percent duties on either processed potato products or fresh potatoes themselves, and we've got competitors in there at, at zero duties. Um, that, that is going to create a huge, huge disadvantage. Um, in some cases, we just flat out don't have the access. You've got to solve the SPS and the TBT issues, but then if you're confronted by your products 40, 50 percent more expensive than your competitor, it's a big ball and chain around your ankles. All right, so I remind you that if you want to ask questions of the group, please send those in on Slido. We've got a couple here. Dan, one comes to you. Uh, how will you supply increased meat exports with uh, U.S. cattle numbers at the lowest mark since the 50s? That's an obstacle. Big time. Yeah, we're getting that question every day. Um, yeah, one way that we're combating that is uh, with maximizing the carcass. Um, you know, there, there's only so many short plates to go around, only so many chuck rolls. So what we're doing is we're working, and, and it's not like we're surprised this is happening. We've known for three years that the cycle's going this way. So this is one of the things we're working with our contacts, the trade, and all these different countries, uh, looking more into the into the the uh, round, for example. What can we do with the knuckle and the inside? What can we do with beef variety meats to fur further utilize them internationally? This doesn't solve the entire problem but it, it solves part of it and, uh, and, and trying to diversify that portfolio. The other thing that we're doing is we're educating, you know, education's the key with the trade. And, and they're most interested not so much in why is the price high, because the price is high right now. It's going to stay high until the cycle changes. Their question is, when will the, the cycle turn? That's what they're interested in. So it's not so much a price question, it's a timing question, which means we're in a pretty good place because they, they really uh, demand our high quality product. Is, are there countries taking advantage of the U.S. short supply now, or, is there, or, or how are the beef numbers uh, globally? Yeah, the uh, Australians are the opposite side of the cycle, and uh, they definitely are taking advantage on the lower end commodity side. Short plates, for example, which go into further processing uh, that's not as easy to, to differentiate. The high-end uh, chilled beef that goes into the center of the plate at retail and food service in places like Japan and Korea, our share hasn't changed much, so we're, we're defending that. But the more commodity, lower-end, price-sensitive products are definitely seeing uh, Australia take advantage of the situation. So let's talk just for a moment. We still lack the farm bill, but thankfully... Uh, the CCC and Secretary Vilsack has come to the rescue. Let's talk about those dollars from the Department of Agriculture. How do you utilize them, and how would you utilize greater dollars if they were available? What would be the return on investment, so to speak? And Dan, we finish with you. Let's start with you. Well, um, yeah, we're going to be extremely aggressive. Um, we're playing defense because of the beef situation on supply, but we're going to turn it into an offensive uh, situation. Uh, and then, really, it's about developing these emerging regions for us, the Indonesias, the Southeast Asias, uh, you know, South America, Colombia, that I mentioned earlier, has a lot of additional opportunity, and the places like Africa. Those are three regions, but one that I haven't mentioned is Central America, where we also have a trade agreement that's working to our advantage. So to answer your question, um, the focus will be global, but the specific focus is in these developing regions. And what is the potential payback? I think it's enormous uh, to the tune of some of the you know, 20, 30 percent growth, even with the reduced beef supplies, is a possibility over time. Cam, how about you? Well, so I, I would just say the talking about MAP before we get to wrap, the, I, I thought it was fantastic that across all of agriculture, one of the most requested items that was coming in uh, to both House and Senate Ag was a request to double those export promotion resources. Um, so that, that, was, that, that was great. It's, a, it's been a long time coming. Uh, you've got to recognize it, it was back in 2002 that we got MAP to its current and all of these programs to their current levels of today with inflation, attrition, uh, uh, various other things. We have substantially less than $200 million a year in the MAP program. It's great that those CCC dollars have are backfilling that need for those export promotion funds in the short term. 
but the real answer is to get a fully reauthorized farm bill uh, with the full resources that we need for, for export promotion. That's going to that's gonna provide a lot of certainty. A lot of our programs don't r run on a one-year basis. They're, they're uh, uh, very sophisticated activities that really need that certainty. Charles, how about one? Uh, just echo everything Cam just said in terms of MAP. Um, hugely important and um, you know, for wine, you know, if you're looking at investing in a, a foreign market, it's like I said, it is a multi-year, if not decade, kind of proposition. And so resources from MAP uh, and RAP are incredibly important uh, when you're talking about a, a smaller, medium-sized wine producer. Um, and so um, I think MAP is just so important, again, because we can invest those funds in any of the markets that we see opportunity in. RAP is uh, a little more restrictive, although we're going to be extremely aggressive as well. And all of those markets I mentioned, India, um, Vietnam, other places, we have been able to make um, some small, small investments around the margins over recent years, but you will see those investments grow significantly. And we've seen, even with those modest investments, that, that we can grow exports in the, the 30, 40, 50% a year range. And, and How about pet food? Market access program is outstanding for us as well. Uh, we use that fund to educate consumers, to work with veterinarians, to go into retailers even, to explain the importance of a complete and balanced nutrition, um, to talk about what how important U.S. pet food is and other the safety measures that we put into place. So we we are a cooperative cooperator with the Market Access Program. We go to 17 different countries. So it's it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience for us, and we, we certainly support doubling that effort uh, for the future as well. Okay, we've got uh, several questions that have come here from our friend Anonymous. Um, <laughs> let's do this rapid fire because we're running out of time, so not everybody has to comment, but you can chime in if you want to, but let's go quick. Has the entry into force of CPTPP impacted U.S. exports and market share for your products? Go. Yes. 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 Is that all? <laughs> okay. All right, Anonymous, here's your second one. Have uh, global crisis affected trade opportunities such as conflicts? And let's dig a little deeper here. <laughs> I mean, yes. Um, the world changed with a pandemic, with wars, with, with transportation infrastructure challenges, uh, with, with um, the ports. It's everything, getting product in, or getting ingredients in to make the products in the United States to get them out. I mean, we bring in, we a lot of our ingredients and products are made in the United States, but sometimes there's packaging or, or minerals that we don't have in the United States that we have to import. So we spend a lot of time helping our companies be able to get the product into also out. And that's where we also support a little more funding for APHIS as well. Other comments on this one? Yeah, um, just quick. Uh, Suez Canal in the Red Sea uh, with the Middle East uh, impacting us without a doubt. Um, the, these sorts, they seem one-off, but they're really not. Uh, those of us in the international world, we know that these vessels don't just go to the Red Sea. They're going around the world. So what you're doing is you're adding more cost, more time, uh, more inputs uh, higher uh, across the board. So uh, the more these conflicts uh, happen or continue to happen, uh, the higher the cost of logistics and freight will be. Okay, going to the speed round here is still, how do you see the current state of the WTO affecting the prospects for U.S. ag, uh, food and ag exports? Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, it's tough to do a speed round on that one. Uh, we need a well-functioning WTO. Is WTO we, dead? I don't, I don't think that it's dead. I'm going to forever be an optimist on that. We, we have to have, in, a, in an increasingly globalizing world, we have to have a forum to resolve these disputes and set the rules uh, if we're going to actually realize all the benefits from, from uh, international trade. Gordon? Totally agree. We need some form of dispute resolution, um, whatever that form might be. All right. First of all, thank you for taking time to answer questions here. Let's go with uh, closing remarks if we can. We've got about four minutes left. So 
uh, ladies first, if you would like, uh, on this topic and with regard to the pet food industry, Jenny. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thanks for the honor to, and privilege to be here today representing our manufacturers. Uh, it's important to us to food safety and nutrition and access for you and your pets, as well as for uh, all of our hearts, truly. So um, just to say that we see opportunities in international markets. We want to be able to have access to those. We appreciate our our. Uh, colleagues at USDA, USTR, APHIS, FAS, working with us to be able to provide this complete and balanced safe nutrition to their dogs and pets as well. So thank you. Kim? Yeah, and I, I would just echo that. The, the, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to represent America's family potato farmers on both domestic and international issues. The international issues are tremendously complicated. No single individual, no single entity is going to solve these. Um, we, we have to have good coordination amongst all of the various agencies, all of the great people in the Foreign Service working in posts around the world. Uh, you've got to have uh, strong collaboration with all of our, our industry folks and our technical partners to get these things right. Some, sometimes it literally takes decades, we've seen that, but it's ultimately it's worth it when you can move the needle in that significant way. Uh, just one quick question before we move away from Cam. How many of you believe that potato is a grain? I think we answered that. Charles? Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, I, I would just agree. I mean, I think we're we're optimistic despite the challenges and headwinds we're facing. I, I take some comfort in hearing about other other uh, sectors dealing with similar challenges. Um, we have a, a long-standing partnership with USDA, FAS, USTR, um, and we just continue to to reiterate the importance of of trying to take a, a holistic approach to, to addressing these, these trade challenges. There is no one-size-fits-all solution, and so uh, it's a long-term prospect, and, and we're in it for the, the long haul. Dan, take us home. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, we're, we're extremely optimistic going forward. Um, I have always looked at it this way, that the more success we have, the more issues that come up. So all the more reason that we have to be aligned as industries. Not, I'm not just talking beef and pork, I'm talking agriculture. Agriculture is the backbone of the American economy. And I think with the folks in this room, on this panel, with FAS, USTR, USDA, uh, we're well equipped to handle the challenge. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big thank you to Dana, Cam, Charles, and Dan for their insights today. All right, as we prepare for our next speaker, let's hear from two of our sponsors, both Bayer and Earth Optics. Our vision of regenerative agriculture checks many boxes. We are uniquely positioned to provide farmers with an entire system of solutions. The support we're providing farmers also has greater societal and environmental benefit. What sets Bayer apart is that we deliver on our promise to advance regenerative agriculture. We increase farm productivity for a growing population. We help farmers adapt to climate change. We restore topsoil, conserve water, and reduce agriculture's negative impact on the environment. It takes all five of our core R&D platforms breeding, biotechnology, chemistry, biologicals, and data science to power our pipeline. Smart solutions, combining the physical and the digital, are the future of farming. A future that increases productivity and nature-positive benefits.